Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with iRack Veteran 8888. And uh, you guessed it, we've got another uh, crazy machine gun uh, video here. I've got Othias with uh, CN Arsenal. And uh, we're gonna be talking about this French Hotchkiss machine gun. This is an eight millimeter Lebel. Very distinctive looking machine gun. I know I've seen a few of these over the years and uh, I've never really dealt with them in person. But for me, like one of the most distinctive features is all this brass hardware, which kind of gives it this crazy futuristic look. It's got some really smooth looking lines on it, which are really cool. And also like this crazy fin here, makes it look like a kind of futuristic ray gun. Yeah, I mean, we know Pretty that cool. a lot of British equipment got used in filming Star Wars. Well, it's yeah. amazing they didn't use the French stuff because this thing is sci-fi right now, but I'm gonna tell you yeah. the real reason, it is heavy. Holy heck, this is a heavy, heavy gun. Yeah, absolutely. So I've assumed that, uh, you know, since we've been dealing with so many World War One era machine guns over the course of this day, that this is another World War One era yep. uh, machine gun. These were in use by the French. Yeah, I'm assuming actually, eight millimeter Lebel would be this, a French cartridge. This was an extremely early machine gun in terms of concept, and a few were produced with not as many modifications all the way back into like 1900. And then when France came around to getting their adopted machine gun, they actually skipped this even though it was available to them. Hmm. And they went for the 1907, which was much more complicated. And hmm. then during the war they went, hey, you know what? We might want to go with the easy, rapidly producible commercial machine gun. And luckily Hotchkiss was ready to provide these. So this is the model 1914 in this case. Few little changes here and there throughout the war, but very good example of an air-cooled, heavy, heavy machine gun from France working off these weird feed strips. Yeah. And uh, one of the most distinctive thing about this type of feeding system is you also see a lot of World War II era Japanese machine guns uh, utilize a very similar Hotchkiss system for some of their machine guns. And, uh, you know, some might argue as to the effectiveness of this, but it does seem like it's pretty reliable, though. I mean, this thing functions really well. It's just the one problem with this kind of system is just how much overhang you have, how hard it is to get low. You got, you know, a lot of handling going up here on the action. Sure. This is where it gets abandoned. It's not as adaptable as the belts. You, yeah. get, you get to play with them all the time. So it's not perfect, but yeah, you're right. The Japanese did adopt the Hotchkisses pretty early and then they kept evolving with that and using that system. Yeah. But all in all, this is the root of some very important uh, machine gun history. And these were in really heavy use, even by US troops. So if you look at a lot of photos of the American Expeditionary Force, you will see things like the Hotchkiss in their hands at first because we'd shipped over men before we shipped over equipment. That's right. Well, that's where we got into using like P-14s, 303 rifles early in the war instead of 30 6 a, a lot of our troops were issued British and French equipment because we sent men before we sent gear. And sure. it was a good way to just go ahead and get the pressure on them. And, you know, there's some benefit to it, but a lot of troops came back with kind of a bad taste for certain equipment. And I think we have some other French equipment that we might see later on. Yes, absolutely. So, but this one, again, USGI probably would have recognized this thing. Absolutely. You know, and this does seem, in terms of manual of arms, a much more active way of running a machine gun, whereby you couldn't just loop together a big belt or something. You know, you would probably need a few more people because this is a much more active system. So as that tray is getting fed in, and it gets towards the end of its feeding cycle, you could just basically clip these in and keep it going. Right, they hook But that together. also requires an assistant gunner to be there clipping the additional trays on as the gun is being fired. So I so there, there is sort of a bit of flexibility that that would provide you. Right. But at the same time, if let's just say your assistant gunner went down in combat, probably be kind of hard to run this by yourself. Uh, you'd have a very difficult time even maneuvering this by yourself. Right. This is extremely cumbersome piece of equipment. Sure. So that, you know, out of all of the, the things that we've looked at in terms of machine guns, this one, in my opinion, seems a little bit more dependent on the, the human factor to run it as, as opposed to, say, the Maxim, where generally it's pretty relatively easy to run by yourself. Even if you don't have a spotter, you know, there are stories in World War One of, you know, certain soldiers being able to climb on a Maxim and get the job done by themselves, making like one man stands against in mass troops and things like that. You know, there are stories of that happening. I would imagine it'd be a lot harder with something like this. I don't think you're going to hip fire it. This is much more <laughs> of like crew, extremely light artillery is the way to think of this one. Like just very, very, very light artillery. Sure. And the eight millimeter Lebel is really one of the earliest smokeless cartridges, isn't it? Yes, actually uh, part of this feed strip system is probably because of the difficulties the French had with this particular cartridge. Um, when they designed it, they just took gras and then they just necked it down. Sure. Well, it creates this odd sort of hump to the shape of the cartridge and it's just terrible to try to get a magazine to feed this. Um, there's all sorts of problems in getting any automatic weapon to run with this cartridge. And so when you have something that's such a positive feed as this, we know where every round is, we feed the round exactly the same indexing point. This control helps you actually manage cartridges like that. And you don't have to worry about the rims locking. Right. So that's one of the, the nice things about this. So I'll tell you what, why don't we, uh, we shoot it some? Sure. Want to? All right. All right, I got my assistant gunner here. May is gonna help me out. 
Uh, we got the enemy coming, so we're going to see if we can uh, lay waste to them in short order. All right, we're going to start our first strip, which I've heard here can be a little bit of a bear, but we're going to give it a try. All right, I think we got our first strip in there. All right, we're going to try to launch a few rounds in. One thing that I noticed, too, is the sights on this gun are very much like the LaBelle rifles. Very, very crude and uh, very, very strange there. All right, let's take a few shots, see where we're at. About two feet low. Uh, you hit a little high, bring it down just a bit. There you go. It's spreading vertically just a bit. See if you can... Right on it. Nice. It's in there. You're spinning them around. You sure? Ah, nice. Good stuff. That is crazy. <laughs> well, we shot the plate down finally. Really appreciate you guys watching today's video. Appreciate y'all coming up and uh, letting us have a little fun with your guns here. And yeah, we'd love to come out here. We love seeing yeah. people. Yeah, appreciate you coming out. Make sure you check out their channel. They're a good bunch of guys. They do some really long documentary style uh, shows. You really love it if you love these old guns. Uh, this is just meant to be kind of a quick look. Uh, if you want to see more detail, check out their channel. Thanks for watching today's video, guys. Have yourselves a great day. We'll see you soon.